Hey everyone, I'm Jeremy Saffron. This is Kitco News. Now today we're tackling one of the most discussed and often controversial topics in global energy space. Of course, that's nuclear power. Now this year has been a big one for nuclear energy. We've seen breakthroughs like the UK's joint European Taurus setting new records in nuclear fusion, fascinating technology. And in the US, Michigan's Palisades plant is set to become the first nuclear reactor restarted after a decade, thanks to a one and a half billion dollar loan Plus, 14 major global banks have thrown their support behind efforts to triple nuclear capacity by 2050, showing how critical nuclear is in the clean energy push, not to mention the need to power AI. But it's not without challenges. There are still big questions around the safety of older reactors, how to manage nuclear waste, and whether the high cost can be justified. And with rising geopolitical tensions, nuclear energy's global role is more complex than ever, as you can imagine. Now, to help us break it all down, I'm joined by Mark Nelson. He's the founder and managing director of Radiant Energy Group. It's an advisory firm specializing in nuclear energy. He was just in New York City for those nuclear announcements we just heard about. Mark, welcome to Kiko News. Thanks for making the time. Thanks for having me. Okay, let's dig into this. I mean, plenty to talk about. As I just mentioned, this past year has seen major developments in nuclear energy. You know, we got this financial backing. We got some policy changes. Uh, give us a lay of the land for those that aren't necessarily that familiar with some of these progressive changes. Uh, what do you think were the most significant milestones for nuclear in 2024? Well, the number one story has got to be the announcement publicly that Three Mile Island was coming back to the grid after five years of being offline, and it was coming back with a colossal, earth-shaking electricity deal between Microsoft and Three Mile Island plant owner Constellation Energy. The announcement sent Constellation soars up 22% in a single day, and I think a lot of that was the market realizing that if one old turned-off nuclear plant can be worth a $16 billion electricity deal, my estimates of which up to half could be profits before before taxes for the plant owner, then that reprices the entirety of the electricity generating landscape. Yeah, yeah. I mean, let's unpack that. That's a big statement because it is a fact. I mean, we keep hearing about AI. We've seen NVIDIA's CEO talk about what a game changer this SMR technology is going to be. We've got a lot to get to. But I mean, you know, despite these advances, nuclear energy is still struggling to shake off concerns about public safety, you know, this public perception. Do you think the industry can overcome these barriers quickly enough to meet these goals by 2050 we're hearing about? Yes, it can overcome the public awareness issues and the, uh, I, you, let's say the public fear issues more quickly than it can figure out how to build nuclear. I think that there's two challenges here. I've I've been doing a lot of public speaking on nuclear power in my career, so six, seven, eight years. It used to be unusual for people with nuclear engineering degrees to be invited to even speak about nuclear, uh, but now things are changing. So I can give the, a firsthand account of the fact that crowds are liking nuclear more and more and more. Here's another thing I can say. The struggle to educate the public is not as big of an issue near nuclear plants that have already been in operation for 40 years. The obvious place to build new nuclear reactors is at existing nuclear plants. So we're not going to see a big not in my backyard or NIMBY issue in adding nuclear. So the struggle really is going to be more getting the industry organized to overcome the problems that have plagued previous construction. And I think that's becoming more clear to everybody now that Republicans and Democrats in the United States Congress love nuclear. They all love nuclear. It's clear that it's not going to even be a partisan divide issue. In terms of the fear of meltdowns, that was part of what made the Three Mile Island story so spectacular. People just assumed that just because a plant like Three Mile Island or Chernobyl has a meltdown, it means it stops producing electricity every day. Not true at all. Chernobyl, most famous nuclear accident in world history, the plant kept running for 14 years. I mean, it just wasn't very famous for continuing to run because everyone wanted the scare story and the, the horror stories about a dead zone and nobody going back. And with Three Mile Island, even though one of the two reactors melted down pretty shortly after starting up, the other reactor stayed in profitable energy generation for uh, a generation and a half, so 40 years, and only shut off because of uh, cheap natural gas prices and the big tech companies being unwilling to buy nuclear electricity because they were worried about how that would affect ESG and, you know, the 
sort of the, the, the uh, call it the legal side and the public relations side of the company wasn't really connected to the power side. And it didn't matter back then because it was enough natural gas and electricity, yeah, nuclear electricity for everybody. What we're seeing now is that the fears of meltdowns are going away faster than ever and leaving us with the problems of actually building new nuclear plants. All right, Mark, obviously, public concerns about nuclear safety still remain strong. I mean, you you mentioned a couple there. We had Fukushima. You know, nuclear is now part of this whole decarbonization conversation, and it's gained a little bit more popularity. But how do you really educate and rebuild public trust into the technology? Honestly, continuing to operate plants safely and effectively every single day as the public sees giant winter storms, summer heat waves, huge hurricanes. And because there's a new attention on nuclear, people are starting to ask, what are the nuclear plants doing in the in the blizzard, in the heat wave, in the hurricane? And what they're finding is that the plants are operating well all the way through the worst natural disasters. That's the big one right there. I hate to say it, but another thing that nuclear has done to regain trust is the fact that global geopolitical disruptions to alternatives For example, pipelines carrying natural gas from Russia were found to be less reliable for the citizens of Europe than were the nuclear plants that they used to think they didn't trust. In other words, uh, the the source you've got at home is better than the one abroad, especially if it's controlled by somebody you can't rely on. So nuclear has been riding through crisis after crisis after crisis. And after each one, when there's a burst of news, people end up liking nuclear more. So it's coming out of a long silence and winning trust just by being seen. I think that's a positive story because as long as it keeps being seen, we are likely to see that trust keep rising. Yeah, true. And I mean, the technology seems like it's progressing along too. But, you know, financial institutions, Barclays, Goldman Sachs, they pledge support for nuclear projects. Uh, You know, how crucial is this financial backing? I mean, we just talked about destigmatizing the industry, but the financing of it is even larger here. I agree, but I'm of the opinion that those banks saying we are open to nuclear business is as much a shot across the bow of the nuclear industry and saying you are not providing us with projects worth financing. We sit here waiting, even if in the past we may not have been allowed about it or if we had even blocked it from being considered clean. We consider it clean now. We will include it in our clean investment thesis and our clean investment funds. You now are on the clock. You must provide us with investable nuclear power plant projects. That is, to me, the loudest message behind the message from the announcements you saw in New York City. Yeah. So are we getting some closer, you know, are we getting closer to this? I mean, we saw, you know, Three Mile Island. We're talking a little bit about this Palisades, but even with financial support, nuclear projects are infamous for delays. There's always cost overruns, as we saw with, you know, Vogel. Uh, How do you address these risks, especially when compared to the rapid scaling of other renewables, wind, solar? We saw this popularity. How do we transition here? Well, First, the rapid scaling of wind and solar was not the same thing as providing power that can work for the data centers. What actually happened was building data centers near reliable power plants, but then claiming that the new wind and solar you built in a different state is actually powering it. So that's that storyline has run out, meaning everyone's staring at the nuclear plants, realizing they're necessary and that we've got to build them. Now what? Yes, I think that we are getting closer to putting together the talent and the coalition of organizations required in a country like America in order to build tens of billions of dollars worth of uh, nuclear plants at one side at one time. The basic problem is we don't have a state-controlled, state-run, vertically integrated nuclear design, construction, engineering, operating ownership firm like China and Russia do. We we don't have that in the U.S. We're going to have to put together utilities that are already excellent at operating existing nuclear plants. We're going to have to put together reactor vendors that have great designs, even if they don't have a great track record of being in charge of construction. We're going to have to bring together construction teams, potentially from Korea, where they know how to construct nuclear power plants of similar designs. And then we have to get that coalition together, put an investable project forward, take advantage of the incentives that Congress has put forward to build new nuclear in America, 
And we're going to have to do that, in my opinion, in the next year or two. And I see motion in that direction. Okay, well, that's good to hear. Uh, Before we get into some of these new technologies, because they're fascinating, and I want you to break it down for the audience, I want to talk a little bit about the handling of nuclear waste. I mean, it continues to be a sticking point for critics. Is there a viable long-term solution to nuclear waste management that can satisfy that public concern and, and still allow for the expansion of nuclear energy? Absolutely. And it's very simple. And it's here today. It's called giving the public access to the nuclear waste that was produced when generating their power. That is, nuclear plants around the world are still neurotic and terrified of the public, even though if the public could just go in and walk in and see the nuclear waste sitting there, I think that the public concerns about nuclear waste would vanish overnight. People would say, wait, we're worrying about what exactly when I have to feed my kids and when there's climate change and I'm worried about my job and 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 you're telling me we're supposed to be worried about this this concrete and steel container that just sits there and doesn't do anything and is only the size of a, of a van? Have I been scammed? That's, that's, that's the solution. Now, there are very, very expensive solutions that different countries are putting into place. Like you can make an underground, like a reverse uranium mine where you put the fuel back in the ground to try to, I don't know, it's like a ritual where if you put it in the ground, it won't come up. It's, it's insane, but if that makes people feel good, before they learn what nuclear waste is, then whatever, maybe some countries are going to do that. Other countries are looking at, for example, making a little like an oil well, but you just without oil, and you put a you drill a borehole down in the ground and you put a container of waste down there and then you and then you close it up. That might work too. But all of these are very, very silly ways of approaching the issue compared to just giving people tours of the nuclear waste as it sits there. Right. So we give tours, we destigmatize them, but what do you do with it? I mean, is there any uses? Like what, you know, people still got those legitimate questions, even if it is a small scale. Well, sure. You can, you can unpackage the waste and blend it into new fuel, but it's much more expensive than just getting new uranium out of the ground. Right. Right. Uh, okay, well, let's talk about some of this new technology, because obviously we've seen this popularity of SMRs, you know, it's a big innovation, these small modular reactors, they kind of promise that it's going to be safer, more, you know, more flexible nuclear power. I, unpack it a little bit here, Mark, and do you see SMRs as the future here in nuclear power? Probably not. Now, I'm very interested in the space. I wrote my thesis in, in, in grad school on one of the advanced reactor technologies, the one that Bill Gates' company is working on. I love it as an engineer, but I, I think that a lot of times people jump into the SMR space or they use the language small modular reactor as a way to feel more comfortable talking about nuclear. So, if a, so for example, the CEO of Google today said that they're looking into SMRs. That doesn't really mean anything, and he doesn't. That doesn't really connect with what they are or aren't doing. It's it's sort of him saying, "Well, we're looking at nuclear, but I don't want you to get mad at me for saying the word nuclear." So I'm going to use a new word that sounds better. Uh, so we have a situation now where a number of the SMRs are looking to be much more expensive and even larger than the existing reactors that are much higher power, and maybe that's okay if you have a country with very low power needs. But it seems likely that if we are needing, say, 5 million people's worth of electricity for a single new data center, that's like the size of a city. It's the size of many countries. So our existing technology should be absolutely spectacular for that. Another thing I would have to add is if we're not good at constructing the existing nuclear plants, it's not clear to me how changing the design is going to make it easier to construct in the future, especially if the power output is much lower from the new plant. Now, claims I've heard is that if you uh, make the reactor in a factory and you make them really fast on an assembly line, that that will be better. Well, maybe we already make the parts for existing reactors in factories and we ship them to site and install them. So I think that there's a rhetoric around the subject that's not really backed up by the reality. Having said that, I myself am an investor and advisor to players in the space, and I think it's fascinating. It's drawing in a lot of outstanding talent and if we see one of these companies become, say, the SpaceX of nuclear, although I think the advantage over the existing players is going to be smaller than the advantage of SpaceX over the existing players in the rocket space, I think it could be a great way for some smaller countries and out-of-the-way areas not connected to the grid to get powerful premium power that's on all the time 
on a shorter time scale than getting the larger traditional plants. So what I'm hearing is from you, correct me if I'm wrong, is that the industry is a little bit too focused on, you know, the next big thing rather than fixing issues with existing nuclear uh, infrastructure that's already there. Hey, this is the industry responding to things like the CEO of Google saying SMR. So it's not that the CEO of Google knows what nuclear reactor types are. It's that it's the word that was going around that is an easier way to approach nuclear than just saying it was there the whole time and then we didn't use it. It's like the red slippers, right? From Wizard of Oz. The things you would needed were there the whole time. Surely that can't be right. We didn't just miss it the whole time. Let's look for some different reason or some different thing that would explain why we didn't look at it because it wasn't right. But now the new thing makes it right. So I, I, I would have to say that this is a somewhat unusual view, but it will become much more popular in the next, say, two years as the need for power for companies like Facebook, Amazon, Google, Meta, as, as those power needs become ever more pressing they'll drop the coded language and they'll just start buying up existing nuclear plants. Yeah, I mean, you've been talking about it, these data centers, AI, driving up this global energy demand. But, you know, the question is, where are we? I mean, how well positioned is nuclear to actually meet the growing energy needs of AI? But more specifically, Mark, is there any specific projects targeting this demand going now? How close are we here? Give us an update. The plain reality is, we set up most of the nation's power grid over the last 20 or 30 years to not build more power plants. We've set it up to not build more of the baseload power plants that would meet the exact needs of baseload energy users like the data centers. So we're coming over this horrible hangover where we didn't build much of anything that goes 24-7. Now we need 24-7 power to get nuclear back up and running is going to take between eight and 12 years in this country. I hate to say it, I wish it wasn't the case, that's how long it'll take. Now, to just make a natural gas plant run longer hours, you can do that tomorrow if there's enough pipeline capacity for the natural gas. Making the coal plant run longer hours, that's as simple as ordering more coal trains in from Wyoming, and then also just ignoring the laws that states have been passing to shut down their coal plants. Is that gonna happen? In some states, yes, in other states, no. We're going to see a lot of fossil fuel plants run really hard as 100% renewable electricity companies uh, go crazy over existing power grid and existing plants. The existing nuclear plants are incredibly well positioned to make extraordinary returns on this demand for exactly the type of power they provide. City scale, always on power, especially if the carbon free thing still matters in a year which I, you know, as somebody who cares about the climate, I think it would be important, but it's not going to be something that I think holds back Facebook and Amazon if they have to have their data centers. They will buy out existing nuclear plants and everyone else will just have to use more fossil fuels. However, the new plants are going to take some time to come in no matter what design they're being uh, deployed, right? That's going to be a time period where if you lock in data center load, you're hopefully going to have a strategy to, to power those data centers with nuclear in the future rather than the fossil fuels that would power them today. Yeah. Mark, you're talking about, you know, this squeeze that we kind of have on the power grid, the fact that, you know, we've really left behind this nuclear industry. Now we're at a place where it's kind of crunched and we say, holy cow, we got to get back here. But we're not talking about uranium. I mean, have we been going into the ground fighting enough uranium? Where are we with the actual resource here? Well, let me just say in a broad sense, there's going to be enough uranium for planet Earth and all the people on it for a couple billion years. Like it, there's, we're, there's not going to be a shortage of uranium the same way there's a debate about whether we're going to run out of oil or, or coal or, or natural gas, right? So there's enough uranium, but have we discovered it and have we put in the mines? We have not put in the mines and there's some of it that's been discovered. Now, there are mines waiting to be placed around the world if the price signal is there. So there's been a brutal 10 year period after Fukushima Daiichi where it would be almost impossible anywhere to get a uranium mine financed and put into operation. And if you did, you probably lost your shirt. So what, when the demand for uranium becomes clear enough, when utilities go and buy long-term supplies of uranium, especially if they have to replace the Russian uranium that we've been getting here in the West, then you're going to see people finally be able to close 
and get their minds funded and get their minds in production. I don't think we're going to see a point where we have to turn off nuclear plants because there's not enough uranium, but that price for uranium could very well go quite high in order to open up the supplies that would be required in the future. Yeah, well, demand, I mean, obviously means investment, right? Uh, Okay, before we pivot here, U.S. policies may be supportive, but countries like Germany are phasing out nuclear energy entirely. Like, How do you reconcile the divergent global perspective on nuclear energy? And and does this difference slow progress on a global scale? Well, first of all, fortunately, there are only three countries in the world with a nuclear phase-out policy being executed. That's Germany, Spain, and Taiwan. Germany has already turned off its nuclear plants, but the majority of Germans think that they should reconsider nuclear. And the government in power that turned off the nuclear plants is deeply, almost historically unpopular. So with elections coming up in 2025 and very slow work decommissioning their current plants that they've turned off. It means that by 2025, if not too much damage has been done to the excellent German nuclear plants that were just turned off uh, a year and a half ago, then what you could see is Germany actually return to nuclear power in a year or two after the decision gets made. For Spain, they in 2027 is when they start turning off their nuclear fleet. They get as much electricity from their nuclear plants as we do in America from nuclear, about 20% or a fifth of their needs from nuclear. And it's uh, likely that there will be a national conversation and a reconsideration of that, but that's an active process and Spanish people are going to have to stand up and demand a different economic future than the one being planned for them, shutting off their best power plants. Taiwan is a desperate, weird situation where they are riding at the edge of grid collapse every summer and they've had people hit a wrong switch and turn off half the island's electricity supply because there's so little extra available. The nuclear plants are the best chance they've got. They have only one left on. We do hope that Taiwan sees reason and reality and keeps that nuclear plant online. Except for that, all the other countries we're seeing are either staying neutral or returning to nuclear or saying they want to add nuclear. Okay, before I let you go, point two, because I did forget to talk about fusion, and it's fascinating. I mean, we talked about SMR, seeing this new technology, but fusion is often referred to as the holy grail of energy, but the timeline seems rather uncertain. So, well, let's talk to the investors and talk about opportunities there, but also before that, explain what this is. I mean, how is this going to change the game? I think holy grail is a great word for fusion because... uh, might not exist, often understood, you may never find it, um, but if you can describe it, it sounds beautiful. So the way I'd put fusion is this, Uh, you're trying to make a small star and get energy out of it, whereas for those of us in fission, uh, large stars, supernovas already made the fuel and we're just cracking it open. So there's a, it's a, it's a galaxy of difference, you might say, between the difficulty levels of fusion and fission but the amounts of energy they give off would be in the same magnitude. So on the fusion thing, you mentioned a breakthrough on fusion news. That gets fusion up to where fission was in about 1940. So fission was discovered in 1938. By 1940, we were doing experiments in labs, making a little bit of fission happen. And by the winter of 1942, we had working self-sustained fission reactions. A few years later, we had multi-hundred megawatt heat output fission reactors. Uh, Within about a decade after that, we had fission reactors making electricity. And about 20 years after that, we had commercial power plants that were considered nearly best in class in the globe of all power plants for how well they made electricity from fission. In fusion, they're now up to where fission was in about 1940, where they're still running the equivalent of lab device experiments, seeing if they can get the fission hot enough or get closer to being able to run for longer than a few seconds at a time. Hmm. Okay, so should investors wait for fusion to become more viable? Or maybe at this point, because we're talking about this upside potential in the next year or two, uh, should they focus on the proven technologies we have today? So I'm not in a position to provide investment advice, and I wouldn't presume to do so. What I've seen smart people do in fusion is invest in an early round of a company because the names of the people investing along with them were very good. And then they dump the shares in aftermarket sales or they find ways to just uh, 
get it on the next bit of good fusion news. And there's going to be good fusion news for the next 50 years in all likelihood without making any fusion electricity on the grid. In other words, you can keep making progress in fusion to get to where fission was in 1940, to where fission was in 1945, to where fission was in 1949, to where fission was in 1954. And each of those is going to cause a surge of good news about fusion around the whole planet. Those might be opportunities that I've heard of people taking advantage of if they're messing around in fusion. But it's not for me. And you can tell I have a particular point of view as a as a as somebody trained in fission engineering. Yeah, yeah, wild. Uh, it's fascinating stuff. Okay, well, I appreciate making the time. Mark Nelson is a founder, managing director of Radiant Energy Group, joining us over from Chicago today. Uh, lots to discuss. It sounds like next year is going to be a fascinating year for this industry. I think it's inevitable at this point. The demand is so strong and public awareness may be at an all-time high by then. Thank you for joining us today. I appreciate your time. I'm Jeremy Saffron for all of us here at Kiko News. Thank you for tuning in. We're going to have some great content coming up. we got lots of economic data, so stay tuned. Press like, subscribe. We'll see you next time.